Hello everyone, it's Benny, and welcome to part two of implementing variance shadow mapping. Now, in the last video, we basically did the bare minimum required to get shadows with variance shadow mapping. So, technically, they work, but they're certainly not perfect, and there's a lot to be improved. For one, these shadow maps right now have a lot of artifacts with them. And that's the topic of this video. We're going to be taking a look at some of the artifacts that come with various shadow mapping and how you can overcome them. So let's go ahead and get to it. One thing you might have noticed is this shadow of the cube here. It doesn't quite look right. The edges here, the edges of the shadow, they almost look like they're trying to make a smooth gradient into being in light, and that's that's not really what we're going for. This is an artifact, it's unique to variance shadow mapping, and it's called light bleeding. And here's the thing. In variance shadow mapping, we're dealing with average depths and variance. Now there's several different scenarios which can ultimately cause light bleeding, but the bottom line is one way or the other, you have some mean invariance, so that there's a very slight chance that there could be some area of light in whatever equation you use to generate that mean invariance. And that's why there's, you know, it's generate a very small probability of there being light, and so there's a very small amount of light in the middle of your shadow. <laughs> that's not what we're, yeah, that's not what we're going for. We don't want that. But we can take advantage of that. Remember, like, yeah, remember what I just said two seconds ago. <gasps> when you're generating, eh, when light bleeding occurs, there's some very small probability that something is being lit when it's not. So we can do a basic hack here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to clamp this, yeah, this Chebyshev's inequality maximum probability, <laughs> yep, that thing, into the range of 0 0.2 to 1. So, this way, if there is some very small amount, it's going to be clamped up to 0 0.2. And then I'm going to subtract 0 0.2. And what this is going to do, well, yeah, so any of those really small values are ultimately going to end up being 0 now. As a side effect, anything that would have normally been around 1 is now at 0 0.8, but well... So yeah, this is going to be perfect. As you see, now there's speckly bits all over the place. Again, this is a cheat, but look. Now edges much darker, there's very... It, it was still there a bit, but there's much, much less light bleeding going on. Now clearly this basic clamp hack isn't going to work by itself, but we can be a bit smarter about it than this basic, you know, clamp hack, like I said. So let's do our clamp hack here a little bit smarter. I'm going to get rid of it right now, so we just have Pmax like it was before, and I'm going to write a new function that'll perform this little hack, I suppose. And it's going to be called float linstep. And unsurprisingly, this is going to work a lot like the step function. It's going to take in some float compare value, and it's going to take in, well, yeah, a solver other value. <laughs> and if that other value is above the first value, then it's going to return 1. And if it's below the first value, it's going to return 0. But there's a catch. I'm actually going to be taking in two of those compare values, a low and a high. And as you can imagine, if this is above the high value, it's going to return 1, and if it's below the low value, it's going to return 0. But if it's somewhere between the low and the high value, the v, I'm going to call it, then we're going to do a linear interpolation between 0 and 1. And we can do that like this. We can take v, subtract the low, and divide it by the range, which would be high minus low. And that'll give us a nice linear interpolation between it. Just to help you visualize, here's sort of an example. Let's say the low is 0 0.2, the high is 1.0, and the value is 0 0.6. So, of course, it's halfway between low and high, so this should be 0 0.5, right? So, what this would do, v minus low, so 0 0.6 minus 0 0.2, 0.4. We're dividing 0.4 by the range. Now, 
our low is 0 0.2, high is 1.0, so we'll do 1 minus 0 0.2, and that's 0 0.8. So 0 0.4 over 0 0.8, yeah, 0 0.5. So that gets us the linear interpolation. It also has the nice side effect that if this if V is outside the range of low and high, well, if it's above high, it's going to be above 1, and if it's below low, it's going to be below 0. So what I can do is I can just clamp this linear interpolation between 0, 0.0 and 1.0, and that'll perform sort of the stepping. And all I have to do now is return. So great. So I'm going to do a lint step. For my low value, I'm going to have 0, 0.2. My high is going to be 1.0, just like in the hack. And my value is going to be Chebyshev's value. Yeah, Chebyshev's inequality maximum percentage thing. Yeah, that thing. <laughs> and there. So let's run. And you notice most of our shadows are fine, but light bleeding, you know, not as bad anymore. It's not perfect, but it's definitely acceptable. If you take into account the Peter Panning you might have with, say, oh, percentage closer filtering, this really is about how the shadow edge would look. In fairness, this isn't the most ideal case for getting nice, perfect light bleeding and such, but hey, hey, it's a lot better. And, you know, we can always play around with it a bit more. We can change this up to 0 0.4 or something. I think that actually might be a little bit too much. But, well, yeah, now there's even less light bleeding. So again, you can play around with it. Oh yeah, and one thing to mention... Since this is ultimately decreasing the range that Chebyshev's inequality, you know, applies, this also has the effect of hardening the shadow. So if I change this up to, say, 0 0.9 or something ridiculous, don't think... Yeah, now we're going right back to hard shadows, with just with linear interpolation. So, yeah, you gotta be a little bit careful with this value, that's all I'm saying. I think 0 0.2 is a good value. It keeps most of the shadow smoothness in there and does a good job of decreasing light, light bleeding, but I'm eventually going to make it a uniform so that, you know, everything's nice and fancy and such. <laughs> now, although variance shadow maps greatly help with the shadow acne problem, they're not immune. So, just to show you a particularly nasty case, I'm going to change the filtering back to nearest, so we don't have any smoothness on. They're razor-sharp, hard-edged shadows now. And for my directional light, I'm going to change the viewing angle to negative 5. So let's build and run that. And you notice, hey, what do you know? We're back with some wonky shadow acne issues. And yeah. But... Fortunately, Variance Shadow Mapping offers a new tool we can use to help fight shadow acne. What are we representing when in our shadow map generator? We're outputting a depth and a depth squared, which is going to be used to, you know, eventually calculate a mean and a variance. What we can do is we can sort of bias the variance. We can give make the data more variant, basically based on the viewing angle, because again, Shadow acne occurs when the v you sort of have an extreme viewing angle of a plane. If you're viewing a plane at a very shallow angle, then that causes a lot of shadow acne. If you're viewing it edge on, or, you know, face on, oof. well, there's no shadow acne. So that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to bias our second moment here, our depth squared, based on the viewing angle, based on how radical the change in depth is, essentially. And that's going to reduce this shadow acne issue a bit. So here's how we're going to do that. First off, I'm going to create a float called depth for this glfragcord.z, just because I think that's a little bit more clear, so change that to depth, and that's fine. And what I'm going to need for the biasing are the partial derivatives. So I have a float dx, that's derivative of f with respect to x, of the depth, and same thing for y. So, derivative of f with respect to y for depth, that's dy. 
And now, our float, we'll call it moment two. Now the math, the reason, yeah, the mathematical reason for why exactly this is a proper depth per pixel bias is a little bit more advanced than I want to spend time on this video. Well, it's not that advanced, but you know, the reasoning behind it's a little more advanced than I want to go yeah, talk about in this video. So I'm going to leave you a link in the description for why exactly this math works. But the way we're going to get the moment squared is just like before, we're going to take depth times depth, and we're going to increase that by one fourth, so 0 0.5, times, and this is in parentheses, the derivative of x squared plus the derivative of y squared. And that gives us an appropriate bias, well, on the variance. And we can just use that moment two there. And now if, if I build well, and run, you notice now it's a bit softer. It's not perfect by itself, but if I add back in linear filtering, then you notice, hey, now the issue's just completely gone. There's no biasing issue at all, even with this ra really extreme viewing angle. So yeah, there you go. And depending on what you do, you might not even need that if you're you know, not having a really extreme viewing angle like this, but I figured it's worth bringing up. And, you know, why not? It's not like there's any extreme cost to it, so, you know, why not do it? So yeah, I'm going to change it back. Or, you know, the direction light back to 45 degrees, like before. And great! So now I think we've successfully conquered the shadow biasing problem, so no more need for biasing. And that mostly solves Peter Panning as well, so there you go. Variance shadow mapping, even excluding all the other benefits we're about to see, just not having to deal with any of that biasing or Peter Panning stuff, I think is a really compelling reason to start using variance shadow mapping, so yeah. So anyways, next up, let's start dealing with our shadow edges here. Because we could deal with this with percentage closer filtering like before, but variance shadow mapping offers us another way. And we'll be talking about what that way is in the next video. So, thank you, hope you enjoyed, hope you learned, and I'll see you next time.